<laughs> wow. Let's start with that noise. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 304 of the Crate and Crowbar, a PC gaming podcast for PC gaming people and more besides. It's a broad church. I'm Marsh Davis. I'm joined this evening by the irrepressible Chris Thurston. Hi. And the irrefutable Alex Wiltshire. No. <laughs> Did you just refute yourself? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I feel unsure of my existence. And I repressed oh. myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This introduction immediately proved incorrect in several fronts. You so idiot. It's a narrow church. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Hello. Hi. Uh, did something gaming related happened this week? I think it's someone, a game came out and people played some games. No. I think so. It's Ooh, impossible to know what the news is because the only news is Black Friday. We're recording this on said deals day. Mm. The, the, the Christmas of November. If you will. Yes. Uh, capitalism's birthday. Um, don't know what else it's called. Bad. It's bad. On the road to Cyber Monday. Mm. Paved with Oh, I forgot that we've still got Cyber Monday to go. Hell yeah. Hell, Hell yeah. yeah. How could you forget Cyber Hell Monday? Yeah. Oh, uh, God. It's exhausting, isn't it? Have you bought anything? Have you explored any hot deals? I haven't explored any hot deals. I thought... Uh, no mice a- with strangely aggressive names. No, I, you see, I don't feel like... Slayer! I think Tom Senior has finally bought all of the Blood light-up hammer. mouse mats that he needs. Mm. So um, that is incidentally where he is today. He is very much locked in the deals mine, eking out raw hyperlink from Internet Funk. It's awful. It I is, hate it. It's genuinely yeah. repulsive. There was a very good article in The Atlantic earlier this week uh, with more information on the sort of working conditions at sort of um, Amazon fulfillment. Uh, yeah. centers uh, throughout the world. I thought that was very well timed. There's been a strike in America, mm. parts of America, in Amazon. Good. Today, which is good. Picketing yeah. in France as well. Yeah. Yeah, that'll take him down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well. But. But in, in between. Well, speaking of fulfillment. Speaking of fulfillment. Well, if we were to, if we were to uh, labor under this yoke just a little longer, uh, we could discuss that uh, apparently, according to PC Gamer, uh, the Valve Index VR headset has basically sold out everywhere in the US and Canada after the announcement of Half-Life Alex. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, maybe as a coda to last week's speculation about whether or not anyone would actually go and buy a thousand pound VR headset and gadgets mm. uh, for, for this. The answer is yes. I suppose the question is, how many of them were there in order to sell yeah. out? Is yeah, it, is a it a significant point. number? And I don't know. Because really. surely, you'd if if you were Valve, you'd probably ramp up slowly production to the launch date rather than mm. quickly make sure we've got huge numbers of stocks now. Although uh, I don't know, I think it kind of works either way, right? Like yeah. they don't want to be, they really don't want there to be a supply issue when the game comes out. Mm. Or else. No, but they do want the double hit of a headline saying it's sold out. That's true. People want it. No such thing as bad press. They say mm. there was some, um, I read about uh, investors getting jitters, over um, investors in CD projects getting jitters because uh, Cyberpunk is coming out on the same day or Ooh. in the same week or something as uh, Half-Life Alex. Oh, hmm? I mean, uh, that's not going to make any difference. No, it's crazy. You kind of, it's just this, this sort of, you can just see this sort of, I just see the investors as these sort of frightened mammals. Yeah. You're like, oh, there's a, there's a noise over there and they all look up and they all just <laughs> run. <laughs> and I think the people who can afford, uh, a thousand pounds for a piece of technology plus yeah. 60 quid or whatever it's going to be for Alex itself, I have no idea. It comes free with the index. Oh, does it? Okay. Yeah. Well, so a thousand pounds for that, they're probably not going to quibble over an extra 40 quid, 50 quid for a cyberpunk, yeah. I think. And yeah, and you know, okay. they are very different games. One of them is an RPG. And, the and one of them's on console. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, I, that's, it's just the, uh, yeah, the, the naked quiveringness of the investor. <laughs> the kind of <laughs> vapid fear. The whites <laughs> of their eyes as they see their money actually always get bigger despite mm. it all. 
Yeah, what a cure. Sure. Yeah. Capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> Refuted. Okay, there you go. <laughs> exactly. I feel like we've really come out of the gate hot in this episode. Mm. I'm not gonna, not gonna lie. I am warm. There's some real, real takes. Mm. Yeah. We've, we've veered maybe slightly left of the center of the road there in our <laughs> scathing critique of the system. <laughs> no one can say we're centrist. Mm. No, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> Would it, uh, is there any other news or should we go on to talking about the expensive entertainment that we've enjoyed this week? <laughs> what are <our> expensive <laughs> systems? I think we should talk about expensive things we've enjoyed. What have you enjoyed? <laughs> um, I've been continuing to, well, I, I've been, I finished, uh, um, a plague tale. Oh yeah. I suppose studios medieval tale of plague and rats and bad monks. Um, and popes. <laughs> uh, it's got popes in it. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, Marsh is in. Well, he might be a bishop. <laughs> might be just a, just a bishop. Maybe. Oh. Okay. How big it. is the hat? Pretty big. Do you mm. fight him? Yes. Oh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> it's a good fight. Down I with think... capitalism, down with the church. We have, this is <laughs> the direction of this podcast. You've just really confused yeah. Reddit. That's the... <laughs> <laughs> Where do we go? Because uh, I, I talked about it ages ago when I first played it, and I did actually finish it. It's one of the few games of recent times that I've actually finished. Um, like, it is a consummate, like, 7 or 8 out of 10 game. Like, but it's... It's squarely in the good sector of that yeah. region, you know, where it has... A helpful droid? It, it has none. It has a small boy oh. who's basically the same. The robots of the past. <laughs> 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 um, so, yeah, this is a... Te- it's, a it's a sort of a story game uh, in which you are playing a young girl or a teenage girl who is in some kind of sort of medieval alternative medieval france around kind of in in sort of general medieval times except for Mm. it's alluding to black death because there's been a great big plague this plague has been born by rats um and they swarm everywhere and they are lethal and has this amazing tech it's by asabo studio who done um uh, the big driving game Mm. called fuel and they're behind um uh, new Microsoft Flight Simulator as well, of course. Mm. Um, so they are, they are tech led in a kind of interesting way. So like the, the tech in this is this sort of basically the fact that you can have 5,000 rats on screen and they swarm and scurry and the ones closest to you kind of dive out into the light towards you because they're scared of light and they kind of shiver back again into this kind of writhing mass and it's kind of gross and takes great pleasure in all that um and i really enjoyed it because it is um it sets out to do exactly what you kind of hope it will which is it has a number of different tools so like you can use light to uh to 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 push them away and there's loads of things like light throwing with your um sling uh uh, a fiery thing which lights things, distance things on fire so you can make paths for yourself. But then there are enemies and they'll hold f- uh, sort of, uh, you know, lanterns and things. And so they'll kind of create paths as well in through this kind of the mass. And, and like it explores all its ideas just really well. Like, mm. and the pacing is good. Like nothing lasts too long. There's a, there's, it's basically a stealth game in, in large portions of it, a bit of puzzle solving. Um, and everything works just well, you know, you're going to think that was satisfying. <laughs> that explored the, what you can do with swarming rats and light. And I feel satisfied by the, hmm. at the end of what it. What is the perspective of the game? Uh, third person. Hmm. And, um, and it ratchets up quite nicely as well. So spoilers for the next couple of minutes. I'm going to just want to talk about the end of the game because, um, so, so in this game, there is some sort of genetic condition which allows certain people to control the rats. Oh. And it turns out that your, <laughs> your baby rat, your baby brother, uh, has, uh, has, has, has got this condition. The and that's why all the, 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 that's why the bad. Vermitage. <laughs> Vermitage. <laughs> and this is why the, the bad bishop is after you because he, he wants this kind of. The Pied Popa. Yeah, the Pied Popa. <laughs> nice. Popa. Good. That could have been some headlines phone back when it was being written about. Mm. And, um, uh, and it basically means by the end of the game, you can create these pillars of rats. You can sort of, 
you you kind of point at the ground and hold down a button and kind of like this great big sort of column of writhing rats kind of builds up and like it models them well enough that like you can see individual rats and they kind of move from there into the column and sort of twist like a tornado is this a, it. a platform for you to stand on essentially what is it now you Mechanical throw it oh, your enemies <laughs> and they consume this them. is not the it's game really i thought good. you were describing at all no like. i thought no. i thought it was kind of a somber kind of almost grittily realistic medieval ah, thing okay. no no it's, it's, it's basically it's very into the schlock like you're oh, going right. through tunnels of sort of glistening rat droppings surrounded by sort of dripping blood and bodies all the time it Oof. loves putting you into a low tunnel with a charnel house kind of effluent running <laughs> between it like it loves Fantastic. that good i can see you love it as well yeah. <laughs> it's the good shit hmm. uh, it's but it's like yeah it wants to eat you, you you are making it them eat people alive and you see there's kellington's after it's really good. wonderful yeah it's real good yeah i i just wanted to point out that like yeah i sort of i didn't know whether it was going to sustain the interest because at the start of a game like that you know they kind of start like they start quite quietly and you wonder is there much you can do with the rats and the lights and like hmm, hmm, yeah there's enough there's <laughs> enough to do with the rats and the lights to make me satisfied hmm. as so i finished it and um yeah cool and yeah like Rel- somewhat relatedly i i tried to play a bit more of it because i don't think we haven't talked about they are billions on the pod mm, have we, we have not no i did do a little searchy search and i didn't see it and i have been trying to play it i haven't really had enough time to put into it because it's gone it's a big old rts it's a sort of zombie survival thing. game right but yeah. from an rts perspective yeah, it's like settlers with zombies right that's a good elevator pitch yeah it is good. Worth. and it like and that's kind of that was the point i was wanted to make really because um it has like it's it's a really good pitch and you kind of think yes i know what that game is and so like when the when the zombies attack they'll come towards a building you've you've set up which is a sawmill creating the wood you need to build the whatnot and that will do the thing um settler style and then it will generate more zombies you know from that building as it infects your workers oh. and then they so basically you let one zombie through and it's quite possible that that one zombie will wipe out your entire kind of level mm. like everything huh. because you know it just sort of goes exponential um if you can't get it early on um but i there's it doesn't quite like i think one of the reasons i didn't play as much as i meant to before tonight and i will do because i want to i want to i want to see if i'm right or not is that it's kind of boring <laughs> oh <laughs> well because because so on the one hand you're doing the, the settler stuff right mm. and you need to protect your settlement like because and it's usually set in wide open areas and there will be some you know level stuff creating corridors and things but in general because you need lots of real estate to expand into because you need loads and loads of houses to, to house all the population you need to support the buildings that you need and so on um it means that you need lots of open space, which means there's lots of open space that zombies can come from. So you've got to keep quite a careful eye on a, quite a wide perimeter, you know. Mm. And it's the startup levels, it always starts quite quietly and there's just a few sort of wandering ones or like, you know, just scattered around and they're dealable with. But that means you need to send out your warrior types out into the world to explore and also to, to get rid of, you know, areas and make sure to find places that you can board up and kind of put, you know, turrets and whatnot on. But, but that, but the fighting is, needs a lot of attention because they can easily get swarmed. How does it work? Is it like micromanaging them or? Well, yeah, well, you can do, I mean, you can do it's standard kind of RTS controls. Um, but because you're exp- having to explore, but also making sure they're not mm. getting swarmed, you need to keep them a close but, eye. So what, what is the threshold for getting infected? Is it just like they get, they get adjacent to the zombies and they turn? Uh, so, or so, so for your warriors, it's just, they just got a health bar and they die. Right. Okay. But for your workers that aren't under any direct control of yours, they will be infected and die. Right. So right. your, your soldiers, they will just get sort of surrounded and, and snuff it. Mm-hmm. But of course, what you're also worrying about is actually leading zombies back to the big base. Uh, you know. Oh, so sometimes it's better to let people die in the wilderness than it is to try and get them back to safety. Uh, well, your soldiers, yeah, sometimes, yeah. But it's, you know, you're just doing all this while you're trying to build up your base. And it means actually the start of it is quite slow and like you're doing the same thing, which is kind of, 
you know the the most the soldiers you have at the start are these um these these archers and they are firing very slowly like boink boink and like so which means you got this sort of uh damage incident in you know you know and then you got to turn get some distance fire again because some of the zombies run at you and others just shuffle and so you kind of keeping them safe and it's mm. it's a lot of micromanagement uh at the start of the game and then like you can easily very easily get overwhelmed and you need actually quite a lot of experience to know how much defense you know how big defenses you should have before you know which will actually be safe against a horde so there will usually be a horde warning like a huge zombie horde is on its way to get you and but you know you need to have built up the resources and the buildings to get you the defenses that are going to get you through that and it's actually pretty fucking hardcore because they know that like it's a really difficult game to balance because mm, it's so yeah. wide open like you know mm. you imagine you imagine the sort of the dynamic range of a player like they build up a bit of a base and it's coming towards what they need to to sort of to do the threshold of you know the wind wind you know the wind condition mm. but uh and then it just throws shitloads of zombies at you and mm. it's kind of thrilling and kind of scary and like last night i lost the whole fucking base because i thought that a, a wall five thick would be enough nope and also they came from a distant like direction along some train tracks that i did not know they could come from yeah. and like yeah no but it's like is, is failure in this gratifying is it permadeath or is it um oh it's just level based it's level based so like oh, you're, you're just playing um preset levels so right. i should probably clarify so this uh, their, their billions came out in early x access maybe two years ago maybe really something like maybe mm. one year ago it's, it's more recent quite a while like it's quite a while but it only had a survival mode so like you right. just be put it onto a map and like you know you just get successively hardcore waves coming at you and you just try to stay alive for as long as you could and like you know, it was fairly fully built out at that point. But now that I've been playing the start of the campaign, which, which, you know, pretty standard stuff, you go into a level, you'll get resources by beating that level or collect them in the level. And then you can invest them in upgrades and stuff, which will take into successive levels. And, right. But you can play levels in any order. You know, actually, I, there's, there isn't even much of a tree, but I think there are some levels that are grayed out and, you know, it's, it's pretty simple stuff, but the levels, some of them are, Starcrafty or like Warcraft three style sort of hero ones where you're kind of walking with one character through a confined space. Others are build up a base, you know, you know, and get to this many population. Right. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I want, I do want to play more, as I said, um, because it's a, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like it's such a strong elevator pitch, but I, it's one of those elevator pitch where I wonder actually whether, it's so evident mm. that actually there's not much to explore beyond it. Right. Yeah, you either fail or you don't. Yeah. And I was like, thinking your description of what it's like when the zombies are... Did you play Frostpunk? Yeah, uh, I did, uh, but not extensively. I played right, it, yeah. so the moment in... I really liked Frostpunk a lot, and one of the things I thought it did really well was tell you like oh there's a this is the game where you are building a sort of steampunk city in a icy crater... And you have to manage it alongside all the city building stuff. Temperature is a real thing. And occasionally you're going to get a storm coming and you yeah. have to just be ready to, to deal with it. And that game, so it teaches you how to build the machine and then how to switch it off in part strategically yeah. to keep it running throughout a crisis. Mm. And, you know, knowing that you're, you know, the game is themed around the tough choices you'll have to make. It's really survival, zombie survival in that way, right? Like which parts of the workforce you're going to sacrifice by forcing them to work on the generators when everyone else gets to go home and stay alive. Um, and this is minor spoilers for Frostpunk, but it's been out more than 18 months now. So hopefully this is okay. But that game, basically it's finale is just putting you through that to the most extreme possible extent where you have to, I think it's like three weeks of, you know, far more desperate conditions than you've ever been in. And that is the end of the game. And I really loved that because it took the whole city building idea and the whole, the, you know, you've been playing this one city for hours and hours and it doesn't matter. You basically, for various reasons, it's going to get better after this, you know, really dark patch of winter. So all you have to do is survive it. And at that point, your job is dismantle this machine you spent all this time yeah, building. Yeah. Every little problem you've built it for, doesn't matter what you sacrifice. You just need to get 
enough people through this and it, you know your research buildings can be burnt for fuel now because you don't you're never going to learn anything else just survive <laughs> and i thought that was a really good yeah. not just not just a good scenario or a good theme but like a good way of having an ending for a city building game because yeah. Yeah. normally it's like well it's kind of done it now hmm. i've made and New there York. it is and i kind yeah. of i don't want you to turn my back on it but at the same time there's nothing more to do yeah whereas giving it this final purpose and yeah. it feels like would you say that's possible in their billions like i'm not within what the game it is i think it would be more interesting for something like that like you because you don't really you know that i mean it's a breezy game and mm -hmm. it's like it wants to be funny it is a cyber it's a it's a steampunk kind of ish sort of world but not exactly artful <laughs> not really not mm. artful about it or oh and the kind of the the barks when you click on you know when you kind of give orders and things really bad Real bad how? Bad. Like bad written, bad spoken? Pretty bad written, but actually very bad written and really badly acted. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And very on every click as well. Oh. You know, how I can you, like, I'm sure surely a lot of them are like, yes. How can you write that incorrect? <laughs> oh, they're trying, to, they're no. trying to be clever. Oh, I've got to remember, I've got to remember them, you know. Like it's a, it's a bit of a like they want to do the Starcraft. Are you going to give me orders? You know, yeah. and for oh, somehow yeah. it's got enough charm to sort of, you just about can manage hearing it five billion times. This great song, Listen One. Mm. <laughs> I try to think of an example. It's the, it's the archers you have at the start and they, they, they are very irritating <laughs> they're kind of, because they're a bit petulant. You sort of think, they're, they're, you can't be petulant. Not, please don't be petulant. Anyway. Anyway. So it wants to be breezy. Um, so it, it, it doesn't have any emotional weight to it. So it would need, mm. It would need a big spin on the old folk, like thematic fulcrum to be able oh, to achieve that. I thought it was that. grimdark. Is it not grimdark? I mean, it, it sort of presses the buttons enough to identify it within that kind of genus. Right. But it wants to be comic book, silly fun as uh, well. It's hmm, also yeah. like, it's all over the place, in fact. Hmm. But it, you know, and that's fine. But it's, it does mean that there's no weight to anything, which is also fine. But I think that it's missing. It means that they, that, that, that what you enjoyed in Frostpunk is impossible because there's, right. you, there's no investment. In dismantling your mm. city, you, there's no kind of meaning to it because uh, other than the, the mechanical stuff that it lent you, yeah. you know, Man, and even really then good. you don't, there, you know, it's just not, it's not awfully, and they, you know, the mission conditions are, you know, have 300 workers and like if you, you if you don't in a settlers style so you you only have 300 workers if you have this, this many houses you only have this many houses you've got this many power stations you only have this many power stations you've got this many sawmills and blah, 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 you know it's that kind yeah. of mm. uh, uh, yeah. uh, the numbers <laughs> which is why actually the busy work is like getting reminded that you can't build the thing that you need you know you've got to build the thing and the, which means you've got to like you've got to shave the yak you every five fucking minutes you know shave the yak you know it's the uh <laughs> it's that programmer thing where you kind of well, i think it came out of programmer thing but where you kind of you want to do a thing and you realize that to do the thing you've got to do that thing and then to do that thing or do that thing and like you end up oh, for right. some reason this chain of causality oh, backwards causality ends up you got to shave the yak so that you can get the milk so you can get the mm -hmm. yeah yeah yes. yeah right that yeah. could you repeat the the noise of management that you just made i don't know what is it was like that sort of <laughs> the numbers <laughs> Do you not feel that when the game says uh, all the time? No, <laughs> no, you can't have what you want because I'm a game, and you're like, I'm irrefutable. <laughs> I'm irrefutable. I irrefutably want this. <laughs> the project management sort of wine winny. But the thing is, I think from from my play on Frostpunk, mm. just to pick on this kind of on that that sort of difference yeah. again. I don't remember getting the yeah no frostpunk, in frostpunk clear. because everything's much more organic and everything's supporting the other thing as opposed to being dependent on the other thing. Right, yeah, like your needs are kind of emerge through the things you're that's trying it. to achieve. That's yeah, it, that's it, that's it. like I think the other thing frostpunk does really well is is that atmosphere. Like it invests really, really hard. It reminds me a bit of Defcon in, in terms of games that go a little bit of an extra step to make you kind of yeah you know you know believe that you're in this scenario so it's basically all, it's not both, so, both games people quietly cough in the background and make you go oh shit yeah <laughs> so rather than go Ooh, it was more sort of oh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah 
Hmm. What noises do you make while playing uh, managing management RTS games? Oh, fuck off. <laughs> Shut up. No, I didn't. <laughs> Reload. <laughs> it's my, my temperament in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, I've been playing a game. It has comparable vibes in certain ways. Not in the setting, but in, in the way I reacted to it. Where uh, It's called Sigma Theory, colon, Cold War. Uh, no, not Hell. colon Cold War, but the actual... Um, <laughs> what is a Sigma Theory? What is a well, Sigma? Tell me what a Sigma So the is. Sigma Theory, it, it's a really cool setting. So it's basically um, a spy management game, um, but uh, it revolves uh, around a particular incident in the near future uh, where the Sigma Theory is developed. And the Sigma Theory is a stand-in for something like quantum computing or the AI singularity, which then precipitates a massive, massive upscaling in the speed with which other research can be done. And so the globe now has like four weeks, basically, uh, uh, during which time major, major earth shattering discoveries will be made, um, as a result of this, this sun, sun speeding up of learning. And it means that everybody's trying to get to the research first because inevitably during this time, people will invent super intelligence and they'll invent n- amazing weapons that will annihilate their enemies. So every, every nation wants to be the one that gets there first and is in charge of it and then can define humanity's fate. Hmm. And so that's played out as a spy game where you are the director of spying stuff for a nation uh, with the specific interest of uh, furthering your nation's research. So what that means is you go to other nations, you infiltrate them with your spies, you steal their research, uh, you set back their research, you seduce or bribe or kidnap their scientists, and you kind of get uh, uh, m- dodgy material on their diplomats and, uh, and coerce them into sabotaging their own nation. Um, so all well, that's really cool. Um, but the way it plays out feels like it, there's so many moving parts to it, but all the systems in it are quite shallow. So a lot of these things that I'm describing now will actually be a fairly digital choice. You begin by recruiting your different spies, and the spies have different capabilities, and they might have their own foibles, and there's some kind of fairly light dialoguing where you pick multiple choice answers in order to get them onto your team at the beginning. But... Uh, the majority of the game is played out through a map screen where you're basically moving portraits to different countries and uh, then you set them a task and it takes them X number of days to complete oh, you it. you like a sort of time bar underneath. Yeah, but then it's just it's up. just like two days, dice roll, did they do it, did they not do like it? Like XCOM without the battles. Kind of. Yeah, yeah, but... um. Oh, so, you got, like, so you've got a probability of succeeding, you know, based on which spy you send into which mission? Yeah, and what other factors there are. I mean, you know, the alert levels in the country. Or I, I don't know to what extent the country's own... Def- they're def- they have their own different defences for against hacking and stuff like this, but it's, some of those stats are a bit obfuscated, so you can't necessarily just do the maths and work out whether right. you'll succeed or not. Is there a country that's particularly um, vulnerable to or resistant to being seduced? Uh, well, it's, it's random which scientists <laughs> okay. are, are, have the various different oh, uh, vulnerabilities at the beginning. So that's science, scientist by scientist, not nation by nation. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Faroe they're, Islands, they're just yeah. so susceptible. There's people of Horningrad, just... <laughs> I did it again. The dirty Horningradians. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Never yeah. been said. Never been said <laughs> in all human history. Yeah. Well, um, so I, I like all that stuff, uh, and it's quite it's quite an operation to to get scientists. I mean, the, the the major way you progress is by stealing other scientists and recruiting other scientists from other nations. That's the speediest way to do it. You can steal research, but it'll. I mean, that's not going to get you much further than you were already, and. Uh, you need to get to s- s- early advances quickly because those advances then accelerate future advances. So there's a real kind of death spiral in the game that you can get into where you're like, oh, well, you know, I'm three re- research items behind now. I might as well stop. So it's give a man a research paper. He will make some science for a day. Yes. Steal a scientist. They'll make robot legs for you. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um uh, but initially, I, the, my first playthrough, I, uh, it's one of those games where failure I don't, I don't find to be particularly 
interesting because and at least on the the first few runs where you just fail because you don't know certain things about the game like i don't know enough about the way the game operates to know that it was unwise for me to send my agents to different countries which in fact it's much more efficient at least early on to send your agents to a single country and have them work on different aspects of the same problem because some of those dice rolls will fail M- more of those up. dice rolls will succeed you have more ways to coerce or you know um get your way in and at the same time as all that's happening, uh, you occasionally get interjections by um, third parties, like, for example, the Caliphate or basically the Illuminati, who will rock up and say, you need to do this thing or it's going to be bad news for you. And um, it, it's, it is bad news because if you don't do the thing that they ask you to, uh, which will sometimes involve a sacrifice of some, some degree um, – they will just remove one of your scientists. So either kill them or, or bribe them to move to another nation. And it's, mm. the thing is, it's so annoying when that happens because that is such a simple digital system. Yeah. And yet in order to set up the, the procurement of a scientist, that might be like 10, maybe 15 different turns. And you're moving all of your operatives around in concert to try and achieve a single thing. Then you finally get them on the fucking plane back. You get back there and, and it, and as soon as you get your scientists off the plane, Mr. Illuminati says, no, actually, uh, we bribed this uh, this uh, scientist you fucking kidnapped, and now they work for Korea. And you're like, no, I don't, how did that work? How could they be bribed if I imprisoned mm. them <laughs> against their will? <laughs> if it's like an external <laughs> system, sort of, you know, it's like it's not the, di- the, the result of your decisions. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, yeah, it's, it feel, what it feels like is the game saying, Ah, no, actually, those 15 turns just didn't matter. Sorry, you haven't really been playing the game for 15 turns. You know, well, I felt like I had. Maybe I'll just uninstall the game. So I did. Sounds a bit like, (laughs) it sounds like it's a bit of a sort of like an overly complex sort of video game kind of pandemic. You know, they've, Mm, they want to do pandemic, but pandemic, all the obstructions like are all inherently part of the system that you're playing yeah in. you see them emerging from yeah. from your failures yeah. over time and like you can feel completely crushed by the game but like mm. well you know that's how it happened yeah you know yeah i did uh, i do admire some things about it I, will, I probably will go back to it actually um yeah it's, when you it's when you figured out you know when you you know those, those sort of slightly obscured uh strategies that you came you know that you mm. kind of came to was that a kind of Oh, cool. I've learned that and I feel good. Or is that like a, uh, if only I'd known that before now. Kind yeah, of more, more, the, more the latter, really, because I don't feel like any of them were such clever revelations that it mm. couldn't have just been tool tipped, really. Because right. that's, that's one of the things cause I've been playing more Unity of Command uh, 2, which I talked mm. about last um, week. And it, while it's a very elegant game and it's sort of, you know, as we were discussing, it's a lot of it's very visual and it's, you know, it, you know, you can, you can have a good time with it, but there are lots of things about it that you need to discover yourself and they are systems based and it just takes time and a bit of manual reading mm-hmm. before you'll get them. But actually, and I was trying to think, now is this fun that I don't have time, Alex? We don't have time on this earth. But if, but in this case, I found it was, I liked, I liked mm. coming to that conclusion, even though it wasn't always me, you, you know, independently coming yeah. to it. It was nudged along by reading something or whatever, but actually, oh, that's how it works. That's yeah. how this system, complex system, but, but I think that's for that game is because well, it's a war game and it's trying to, it, it's like very abstracted, but it was trying to simulate a war, you know, war, like a historical events yeah. in war. And like, of course it's complicated. And of course I should expect to spend some time learning the nuances. And, but I, I definitely kind of like, mm, is this, is this good? Because, because mm. most of the games I've played lately, you know, over the past few years, in fact, that I've felt they were really, really good, especially in strategy games, they are self evident. And the revelations you come to are self-driven and they were right in front of you all along. And it took that experience right. to, to see mm. them and like, oh, actually, I feel empowered by coming to it, you know? Yeah, um, I think I think one of the problems with this game is the more you learn about its systems, the more more transparent and and simplistic they, they become. So there's... Uh, I, I'd, ra- I'd rather that they had fewer elements to juggle and those elements were kind of more fleshed out and deeper. Uh, but the, for example, in order to, um, uh, 
sometimes you need to set up a meeting with a diplomat between your diplomat and the other country's dipl- diplomat so that you can um, get them to reduce the alert level in their country. Or there's a bunch of other things that you can pressure them to do. But you don't get to be able to pressure them to do things unless you have something on them uh, and you can get things on them by uh, knowing what character traits they have. So sometimes they'll be arrogant and you can pick the dialogue option which then satisfies their arrogance. But after you've done that once and you see another character with an arrogant trait, then you just know which which dialogue option to pick. And suddenly mm. the more that you play the game, the less interesting this system becomes because you have – it's there's almost no point you then interacting with this. Why am I going to this menu, clicking on this thing, waiting two days, getting an interview just to click this button that I know I'm going to click in two days' time? Like I could just automate that now. And so to not know that stuff, which then turns out to be not particularly re- revelatory or interesting, is is the, is the problem, I think. I think if it was a kind of mushier, kind of vaguer system, mm-hmm. actually, it would probably be more interesting. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Chris. I could talk about robot legs briefly, but only yeah. very briefly. Okay. Um, so, you might, so this is the only thing I'll say about it. So I, uh, I played a few little things this week, not really dived super deep on anything. I have... Continue to plug away at Death Stranding, and I would like to make one note, which is I've now unlocked the ability to find uh, active skeletons, which mm. are robot legs, basically, mm. that allow you to carry more boxes upon Norm- Norman Reedus' back. The only thing I would like to say about this is when you discover these, uh, you get a cutscene in which uh, uh, Margaret Qualley's character uh, explains the gadgets to you, because that's often what she does, and... Um, she is talking to you about uh, the benefits of having an active skeleton or an AS. Hmm. But the way she says this makes it sound like she's saying the word ass, but in a Southern <laughs> accent. So she talks a lot about your powerful AS um, several times in a way that I found very amusing. And that's all of my Death Stranding news <laughs> for this week. Um, I've got a level two AS now. Uh, and uh, then I fell over in a river and uh, almost drowned my baby. Oh, no. Did your AS get rusty? No, my AS got wet. Um, <laughs> anyway, what else have I done? Talking about my AS getting wet, I started playing Sea of Thieves. Uh, I don't know oh. if I've actually talked about Sea of Thieves on the podcast yeah, much. Yeah, I, I, I have played it briefly, but I didn't mm. ever get a proper bloody gaming with friends. Right, so I want to talk about that because... So I've, we played one evening of it, um, and to do this... I signed up for the uh, Xbox Game Pass thing, which is one increasingly pound one pound this month. Mm. Thanks, Black Friday. Big shout out. Love it. Yeah. Mwah, Cyber Monday. And um, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so which makes, you know, it's the it's Microsoft's game subscription service. I think for the PC stuff, it's four pounds a month normally, which again is not terrible. Um and actually that selection is pretty good now. Like, for example, I've been wanting to play Bloodstained, the sort of Castlevania mm. style game. And I came very close to buying it in the Steam sale where it's gone down from 35 quid to 25 quid. Then I saw, oh, it's in the Xbox Game Pass. So I'll just do that mm. then. So that's good. Kind of, um, that's a bonus. But yeah, so I picked up Sea of Thieves, installed it. Um, and I think actually it's a good fit for a subscription game like this because, uh, I can understand, like, so I, I don't think we talked about it, and I think a lot of people will be familiar with it, so I don't want to dwell on what it is too much, but it's the co-op sailing pirate game where you go on pirate adventures and solve puzzles and find treasure and, and encounter other players and stuff. And more than anything else, it has the uh, sort of uh, logistical complexity of like a board game night or a D&D <laughs> campaign in that, it you know, you can you choose what kind of boat you want, which affects whether you're playing with two, three, or four other people. Or, you know, in your party. Um, and that's a good system. But, like, it is wholly designed for you to set up a session and play for a, a chunk of time. Like, uh, going off on an expedition is not a short or breezy thing. Like, I think there's an arena mode if you want to just tool about in a boat and fight people. And that's a good idea. But, you know, it's like an evening of play, um, which may or may not result in much change, may not be, be satisfying, uh, based on what I played of it. With, with uh, as happened to us, the full... Um, a probability of going on a multi-stage journey, solving riddles, finding secret treasure, and then failing and l- hmm. losing everything and just being back to square one. Um, is it a single fail point or is it like well, retry so and retry and retry? No, it's, it's just done. You're mm-hmm. back to the beginning of a multi-hour kind of thing and you just go and do it again on a different night, which is sort of um, quite more like a more board game-like or yeah. sort of 
that kind of thing. And so it's a really interesting kind of proposition. So that's part of the way I wanted to approach it is like just as a, you know, it has almost that I could see no concessions to being like, uh, you know, normally if you pay and, you know, 30, 40 quid in a game, you, even if it's a co-op game, you have the sense that like, oh, well, I can probably get some entertainment value out of this when it's just me or I'm just tooling around, whether that's left for dead with bots or whatever that format would take. Sea of Thieves doesn't really have any concession to that. This yeah. is something that you load up when your friends are there ready to play it. Which actually means it's a good fit for something like a subscription service where if you're, you've are you got that subscription service because you want to play Gears of War or Forza or something like that, but then enough people are around for you to load right. up the fun pirate game, it actually makes loads of sense. And taking out that barrier to entry where it's like, but who owns it and has it installed is the only way it's viable. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of interesting. Like the, um, I did really enjoy it. Um, it's, I think it's, it's had, you know, loads and loads of polish and new features and things since it came out and it felt, it released quite sort of bare bones, didn't it? Yeah. And it feels very full of, of stuff to do. Like the sailing is very detailed and, um, you could just do a lot of bailing. You can do a lot of bailing, Mm. but like even down to like having different ropes to change the, you know, the angle of the sails and the, the degree to which the sails are uh you know uh hauled or not and and uh, hoisted and i i found myself initially navigating being the person down on the map telling you know trying to figure out what island to go to has a good line in puzzles which require you to look at the map really and you know so you'll be told this thing is between these two islands you have to Hmm. find them and sort of figure out what that might be and when you're looking at the map you definitely can't see anything else so you're you know shouting up to your friend who's looking out of the telescope saying like can you see something that looks a bit like this and they either do or they don't very analog puzzle solving which mm. i really really like yeah, yeah. or like you know this you know this will be this the treasure is under the water west of a small island some distance from this place and so you have to guess and you go and when you find it it's really satisfying that's all really good and it's pleasingly sort of um you know dramatic like the, the water is incredible that's one thing like storms feel very very dramatic i think um and you know we got into a, a an encounter with a another player boat uh you know initially had another ship approaching and you get the initial nerves of what they're going to do and then we started flashing the lanterns on the front of the boat and then they did the same and it was like oh cool we're gonna pass like ships in the night but you know and then there's no interest in a fight later on we did get in a fight and you know did a dramatically drop the anchor to do a handbrake turn which um it like that bit in pirates of the caribbean which it lets you do without breaking the boat and that's cool um lots of running around and bailing and things it feels like there's a really high skill ceiling of how successfully it'd be possible to cooperate um but in the sense of a lot of co-op games like this like things like daisy i would say or PUBG, it definitely feels like a game where you have the session every 10th session is the one where you have the amazing story and every other time things just sort of go like Oh, oh yeah. you know, they can't. But it's more of a, like a social space, really, isn't it? Right. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're going for a sale. Yeah. The musical instruments are really nice. Like you, you know, it's really, really well implemented. Good um, shanty tech. Very good shanty tech. So the way that works is the first person to start playing an instrument is the leader. Everyone else who subsequently starts playing an instrument will play whatever they're playing in time with them, regardless of what instrument they're playing, which is really nice because suddenly you're all playing Ride of the Valkyries on an accordion while, <laughs> while barreling into into a storm yeah it's, it's it's a hangout game i think uh so i feel like i've played nowhere near enough of it to you know for a kind of critical judgment of most of its systems i mm. in, had a nice time we had a nice time pootling around but i do i do think that that's almost a genre now unto itself or like the uh, to the extent that you can divide yeah the poodle the poodle game mm. or the you know I, like i wrote a thing not to i wrote a thing for eurogamer last year last christmas i think it was last yeah it was last christmas about um, PUBG is golf. The, that game functionally f- fulfills the same purpose that golf does. I don't, I don't play golf myself, but, you know, I'm not to say that golf isn't, isn't a competitive exercise in its own way, but a lot of people who encounter it encounter it as something to do while you're going for a walk and hanging out with another couple of mm, people, right? A nice work, walk spoiled is the, uh, yeah, joke. right, yeah. Well, that was the kind of, that was where I kind of got that from for the article because the, the real way you spoil a nice walk is when someone shoots you with a K 98 <laughs> while you're rooting through some bins. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but like, yeah, like the, that, that sort of purpose of activity is a kind of just a reason to be out doing something. Yeah. And I think that's sort of an underappreciated. I think a lot of multiplayer games fall into that category, right? Right. But it's, I mean, we always used to, I mean, even going back as far as like Halo, the Halo mm. 2 scene was just about me hanging out with friends really. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think we tend to define genre by what a game is for 
as so much as how you control it or what yeah. you do what, in it what or you whatever, do what you do and that makes sense but i would put sea of thieves and PUBG and Fortnite to an extent mm. and but i think they also they, they, they exist on a gradient which is interesting to track you know i think PUBG is a far more successful hangout game than Fortnite is mm. because Fortnite is much busier with stuff to do it's much more keen to give you something to do immediately mm. and you can measure a game's success as a hangout experience by it, the cadence of yeah. the need to shut the fuck up and cooperate so you know well but I mean, that's only when people are playing it i mean people might be playing it but sitting in the lobbies predominantly of course of course yeah i, I think but i'm talking about within the within the scope of the game design right sure where games like you know i always thought that this is one of the interesting things about uh dota and i've broken that seal again but <laughs> like um you know that game has when you're learning it you go through you know when you get experience with it you are thinking all the time and and trying to play efficiently all the time when you're learning it it's a game that has vast tracts of nothing really going on between fights that are very confusing and so that's one of the reasons it functions as a hangout game because it has almost like downtime as part of its design right you know there are times when you're just farming or you're just doing this and then it all comes together for a strategic moment compare that to battlefield or mm. call of duty where you're always doing something yeah, you're you not you know, the graph of activity and yeah kind of the you're always moving either like running back to a gunfight yes. or in the gunfight yeah rather than there being periods of as in PUBG, just walking for a bit mm. you know uh sea of thieves very much has just sailing just sailing we're gonna get there in five minutes right now we're just mm. sailing i'm gonna eat a banana and run around and yeah. play the accordion this I've been watching um, my son playing um, Minecraft. He's got back into his in Minecraft mm. with all his friends, and they've they've all had, done a realms server, so they're all mm. on this server. And it's re- yeah, it's just basically just chatting with his friends, and sort of in that liminal kind of. I'm we're partly talking about the game and what we're doing and kind of yeah. planning stuff, but also just chatting shit, which is you know, and that's mm. it's nice seeing that. And I think. I think Minecraft is the quintessential poodle game. Yeah. I think MMOs have an interesting an relationship MMO. with this. Well, because I was thinking with the golf thing, like that was the kind of the apocryphal thing about MM of, of WoW was that, that right, like in the past, Hollywood deals, this is like, who knows whether this is true, but in the past, uh, Hollywood deals tended to be done on the golf course. Right. But then there was this period in 2000 and <laughs> like, like October 2007 or something where, where deals started to get done by this sort of younger generation of kind in of wow, deal makers yeah. in wow, because that's where they were hanging out apparently like, huh. but it was the very fact that that kind of went, mm. you know, that became understood, you know, that it was interesting in itself. Yeah. I just think it's interesting to see games be designed for that. Mm. Right. And, um, and how they fit into the business model. Cause I think if, if that Xbox Game Pass didn't exist, Sea of Thieves would be an almost an invi- unviable proposition. Mm. You know, at sort of 35 quid for a hangout, people will balk at that, I think. Whereas as part of this otherwise good deal, I can see it kind of working. It's interesting. Like there's so many things that need to exist for this to happen. Like you yeah. need, you know, like the, 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 the subscription model is really important, as you said, like to, to making sure that people can actually, you know, access and buy it. You also need like, uh, you know, white, like broadband that is, you know, limitless because mm. you're just online for a fucking long time, mm. you know, and you're downloading vast fucking files and things. You know, there are so many things that need to exist, like the culture needs to switch to, being generally in front of a computer rather than... Yeah, need to right. shave those yaks. Yeah, to shave all the yaks. But I, I think that that... I think, you know, 10 years ago, like, we are far more in front of a device than we were. Like, and that's not... Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a fairly... Yeah, like, the assumption that the, di- the device will be there, just yeah. which, which device it is, is, yeah. is definitely necessary for this kind of thing. It's, yeah, it's, and not being taken up by the member, family, family member because it's on the TV. And, you know, the PC was always separate to that. Well, yeah. most households... Maybe quite a lot of people had family PCs. It's interesting. Mm, it is. Time now you've uh, broached the Dota seal. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I played uh, Dota Underlords this week. So oh. did I. Um, I played it because uh, Aubrey Hesselgren, formerly of Campo Santo, now of Valve, and uh, somebody I've known on the internet since I was a tiny baby internet man. Yeah, I've uh, known Aubrey for years as well. I think he was one of the first games industry people I ever met. He was actually at the same table as me, Mike Channel, and John T. Hicks when I got my first commission work in the games industry. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's a lovely man. He is. 
Uh, but he, I, I think it was him anyway. Christ, I don't, I hope I'm not misattributing, but he tweeted about, um, Dota Underlord's new knockout mode and said, this is, uh, the way to get into the game. It's so much fun and it's like, uh, it's, it's like the, recent Forza Horizon game where it has this amazing introduction. Do you, which one was it? What was the most recent one? Uh, Horizon, Horizon 2? 4, 3? Oh, I don't it's one set in Britain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it ha- has this incredible opening, first 15 minutes, which kind of takes you through all of the different modes. It's just like, uh, to, to use Graham's least favourite phrase, a smorgasbord of cars <laughs> rather than meat. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, a it, forces board, if you will. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, I feel unclean. But it's, uh, it's, it's really appetizing and delicious, even to somebody who doesn't really particularly like, um, cogs or car cogs. 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 <laughs> cogs. Cog. <laughs> 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 uh, so I, I played um, Dota Underlords, and it, uh, it does it does a good job of telling you, you know, what what the idea of the game is, and what to click on, and how you buy things from the shop. And it's like now learn to drive three thousand different cars, <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay. I, you've illustrated to me in a very short space of time, very efficiently, that I'm never going to learn this game. Uh, and Your so, first um, mistake. Eleven minutes in, was listening to a Valve employee <laughs> tell the <laughs> Valve game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, no, that's true. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know that he's been there long enough to be uh, <laughs> fully indoctrinated. To, 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 to have, yeah, been subsumed into. I thought that the Dodge Run Lords, the, the, I mean, I played it uh, when it came out, and mm. I thought the the tutorial was enough to tell me what's going on. They have I made it quite okay. a lot more complicated. Oh, have they? You, you have to choose an Underlord now, who is you, but is also a character in the game who levels up. Using mm. hype, hype. Yeah, I didn't Where's the hype really understand from? that system. They've added a lot of jokes to it. In quite a, some of them are all right, but, but yeah. Where's the but fundamentally, I mean, it's still a game about a huge roster of characters yes. whose different abilities, and there are many, will interact with each other in unknowable ways to you mm. as a yes. neonate. So it's it's just it's just a lot of stuff, isn't it? It's oh, yeah. we put loads of stuff in our game. I'm like, I don't want more stuff. I've got <laughs> enough stuff. Yeah. Make it simple. I'm overwhelmed and frightened, please. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I think scurried it, back into my little hole. It's yeah, certainly a game where, like, the stuff is thrown at you. There is no kind of trickle to the stuff. It is stuff. This is all the stuff. Lightning hot criticism. Yeah. <laughs> From all Content of it. Yeah. stuff. I remember uh, talking of stuff. Sorry, you'll, you'll have your chance to talk about Dutch Hunt was a second, but for go this for one it. moment, please, we'll no, diverge please go ahead, yeah. with a, uh, I remember being in, uh, Graham's old house actually, where, uh, John Walker lived at the time. And I was, uh, visiting John Walker and, uh, Richard Cobbett was there. Both men who I have a great deal of affection for, uh, but who spent the entire evening berating me about how I was wrong about Dragon Age. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, they loved it. And I thought it was kind of naff. This is um, Dragon Age 1. Dragon Age 1, which I... I remember I, that era. I played uh, for review just after going freelance, and it was like 100, 100 hours at least I put into mm. that game. And I didn't like it very much. So it was a kind of painful uh, entry into the world of freelance for me. Um, but their main point was that it had just loads of stuff in it. And it's like, no, but they've... But, you know, there's loads of lore. There's just all this lore. Uh, and, 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 you know, you can open, there's books about, there's got like a, you know, a, a, the church has all this backstory and fiction supporting it. You've got a lot of stuff. You don't get points for that. Yeah, you do. Because if you add up all the stuff, you get more points than if you have <laughs> good quality, fewer number of stuff. I have to say I'm with Alex on this one. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. no, you're completely right. I had the exact same crisis reviewing Assassin's Creed 3. I think I've said this on the podcast mm. before, but that game is, is garbage, but it's got a lot in it. It's, mm. it's got a lot in it. And I was like, but I think that that one is garbage because of that. Like Dragon Age is separate. I, I do love the first Dragon Age game. I have to admit, yeah, but sure. like, but it also was a very particular, I don't know how I feel about it now. It was a very particular period in my life where I was very much ready for that game and all of its stuff. Mm. I think value, but pro- value proposition is very personal, right? Yeah. Like it's a, you know, and it changes from time to time. Yeah. Well. You know, um, in that case, it was, I just want a big, a big chunky RPG to completely lose myself in because yeah. I'm temping for a pension company. <laughs> and my only <laughs> job at the time was 
to make sure that um, the data in one set of spreadsheets match the data in a database that was otherwise incompatible with the spreadsheets. Hmm. This is something that you could pay a programmer to fix over the course of a week so that the two things could be compared. But no, they just hired temps to look at numbers from one printout and type them into a machine to make sure they match numbers in a different printout. You, you had to type them yeah. in. Yeah, I got really good. I, I'm, I'm still very good at um, touch typing on a numpad because of having to type these like 10, 12 character oh, Jesus. strings constantly mm. at very, very quickly. Dragon That's why Age I, does probably does look incredibly attractive. Yeah, so that was my life. <laughs> that was my life at the time. And then Dragon Age came out and I just did that. And it was good. It was really good. There was so much stuff in it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was stuff I could yeah. think about and take. And the great thing about law, you can take it home with you. You can take it to work with you. You can be thinking about the Andrastian church while you're mm. typing out numbers of people's, the values of people's pension funds over and over and over again. Thinking about the taint. Chris. Thinking about the taint. Just always thinking about the taint. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes if you're too big a wizard, you're going to struggle with the taint. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I feel, <laughs> but I feel a similar sort of thing about the mechanics of Dota likes mm. uh, and those games, which are meant to be perpetually evolving, you know, mega metas. Mm. These just big meta balls that are rolling forever and ever and ever. And I just, I just feel just completely exhausted by it. And I don't necessarily know that it's additive. It's just sort of, it's there to keep people trading water. And I, I don't know. I, f- mm. I feel it's almost not exactly exploitative, but it does not exploitative in, in a kind of immoral sense, but it's definitely exploiting a, a, uh, a psychological characteristic, I think, in some way to, to make itself perpetually attractive, perpetually interesting. Yeah. And I don't know that that's. That's what I want, at least not in this stage of my life. I think if I was a younger man and I could commit loads of hours to these sort of things, I'd just be sucked into it. I'd be happy to to have the social experience that mm. you have in those games and just be sort of paddling along with all my friends. But because I only can dip into things, really, I like things which are I can play intensively for a very short period of time, I think. And so, yeah, right. Dungeon Underlords... It's never going to be the game for me. I'm glad. It, I'm glad it showed me that really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> that is at least fair. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because so ah, oh boy, we're going for it. Dota had a massive patch this week. Dota two, as in mm. main Dota, and it's, I hear it's got mangoes now. It's had mangoes for a long. There's time. There's actually a question oh, okay. about this. Um, but well, we we'll get it to now. it. But all I would say is it's bananas, and this happens every time. Every Dota patch brings. Mm. Friends I haven't spoken to for a while because we haven't, you know, caught up in a while. Out of the woodwork to talk about how everything has changed. It's no game that I can think of changes like Dota does. Like it's, it's crazy. Is, anyone is, that, is, that, else, is that like comparing it? I mean, because I don't know anything about League of Legends. And, and the way yeah, well, no, League, more, it's, it's, more it's night and day. Like it's absolutely right. night and day. Like the, like, um, I mean, so League goes through revamps and refreshes and things, but it, it is, um, it's far more kind of controlled in like maybe what the acceptable changes are to some extent. I think maybe there are going to be examples where things happen more dramatically. Um, but Dota is more of a sandbox and the changes that get made to that sandbox are vast, you know, in terms of their, what they mean for the game, you know, whole vectors of chance and probability being added out of completely nowhere. Like the next less patch changes kind of how you even think about items which are a core concept of the game. Mm. Um, just completely different. It's mad. But the reason for that, and we're going to the nitty gritty details, um, but the reason for it really is that um, the appeal of that game as a competitive sandbox and a place to hang out over time is that it, it's unsolvedness. Uh, when a game like that gets mm. solved, it naturally starts to filter its players into into groups. And obviously it does anyway, right? Dota has pretty, it's a very, very brutal skill curve and it always will be and it's, I'm playing it for seven years now and it's still brutal. Um, but, uh, as soon as a game can be solved, it, it boils down pretty quickly to people who take it seriously and people who are just sort of there for the, for the ride. Mm. And, you know, I would describe any given edition of Street Fighter as kind of having that thing. You know, your, your journey with it is your journey towards playing it properly. Not, mm. you know, not towards, you know, you start off experimenting and trying things and having fun and bashing buttons with your mates and you end it knowing what good looks like and just trying to achieve it. Whereas the magic of these games that change so much, Dota specifically for me is, is living in that sort of weird, ever evolving. We, we can jump back in despite not having played seriously for six months and almost find a different game and try and take some of the skills with you, but everyone is trying to adapt and nothing is solved. And even at the most, the highest professional level, players are relearning the game constantly there is a i think there is a difference though in the approaches of 
weirdly enough, like D- Underlords and Dota, mm. in that Dota is very system- systems-led and it's not mastery of it isn't so like there is a lot of memorization you have to know a lot you have to of know information, stuff yeah it's a huge knowledge system. but but mostly it's about understanding systems yeah um, like and, and internalizing them but like mm. remembering numbers and remembering relationships and things isn't quite as important it's like this system yeah. i think that underlords and the games like it team fight tactics and whatever are very content based like you have to remember a fuckload of stuff yeah. you have to know the things that that character does and how that would interact with this character like it, it is and the systems are less important to it and i think that they they're two diff, quite different speciality like specialisms mm. and like you know and like systems led and, and knowledge content led and like when it seems to me like the the ongoing development of underlords is about adding shit or like shuffling around the shit so that the stuff is different whereas dota is about changing systems so that like you know now diff- there are different flows that are happening and yeah for you, that you kind of i mean i think yeah i mean they both involve a lot of remembering stuff i think that's true i'll give you an example actually i think is interesting and so one of the one of the flagship things that's been added to dota and i think it's interesting how the community's partly taken it versus what i think the intent is um because what it's what's basically happened is is creeps in the jungle like neutral monsters now have a chance to drop items and these are not items that you would otherwise buy. They're from unique pools, like of sort of exclusive items. Uh, it's pseudo random distribution, which means that a certain amount of time goes without this having happened. It gets more likely every time a monster dies that it will eventually drop an item. And the loot pool that can be drawn from depends on how much time has elapsed in the game. Hmm. So if a game goes past 70 minutes, so into the super late game, uh, the crazy items start dropping from jungle camps, which are designed to end the game. And it means that if you, if you're in a stalemate, but let's say one team has full control of the map and they're full control of the jungle, they're going to be able to farm up some crazy items that allow them to push and end the game. Hmm. But one thing that's interesting about this is characters in Dota still only have six inventory slots. And every, you know, decades of people's lives now have been spent refining the best use of those six inventory slots for each character. And that changes with patches and items being tweaked and adjusted and characters being tweaked and adjusted. But broadly speaking, in a patch, if you are playing a character in a particular position, you'll have a sense of what your build is going to be. What these drops do is add the effect that uh, drops and items have in roguelikes, which is when you start off on your Slay the Spire run or your Spelunky run, whatever, with a particular idea in mind, but your actual eventual playstyle will be governed probably by something that happens by happenstance oh, halfway that's through. that's really right? interesting because mm. Dota is not that big on randomization in it's the not. past. It's not. And what's interesting is you watch the community freak out, like saying, well, they've reduced random... Like, So a lot of... Dota, Dota has... A bunch of stuff that has randomness in yeah, it. Yeah, there's like, like sort of there's a chances. chance to do yeah. yeah, but it's not you know, yeah. and, and that stuff has been contentious in the past, and actually some recent patches have found ways to dial down on some of that. Like stuff um particularly when it comes to the random spawns of runes and power ups in different parts of the map that can you know, there are famous examples from, you know, professional matches where a rune spawns in a particular place at a particular time and it just wins the game. And it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's not that the whole game wasn't up, you know, skillful up to that point, but people notice these moments where RNG swings things. And so people freak out a bit when they see random items. But actually what's interesting about it is it creates this extra level of strategy now where it's like, oh, well, this item is spawned and they all do something weird. So it's like this one will make your, give you extra range on ranged attacks and your ranged attacks now reduce the magic resistance of the person you're shooting at. Which might mean that if you have a character who has a choice between going for magic damage or physical damage, maybe you start swinging your build towards magic damage because you can take more advantage of that with this item you happen to have found. Those items can't be sold, but they can be given to your teammates as well, which means hmm. it has this strategic level of, I've just found this. I think this would be good for you. Oh, but I was building in this way, maybe. And so, you know, it's like, like in a, you know, again, I would compare it to like, say, Aspire, I think, where hmm. suddenly hmm. a particular card showing up as a drop or or something in the shop oh, go, now go, oh shit actually this around. this run is now about this yeah, and that's yeah. you know that's a, i think a really interesting space for a competitive game because mm. it's like this match is now about this paradigm and we're going to play this out rather than try and um stick to a you know the the weakest games in this genre and i liked the game but i would put heroes of the storm in this category uh come down to playbook play where it's like mm. there is a play you know we played hot smart Ian. it's like this is this you play this map by doing this thing and whatever yeah. characters you have 
will change how you achieve that somewhat. But basically it's like, did you kill the skeletons at the right time? Did you do this? Did you do that? And whether you win or lose comes down to your efficiency, mm. basically. Whereas what they're doing with that game, with Dota now feels really weird and interesting. But also, crucially, I was going to say, and relevant to the other games, kind of irrelevant to a new player in a way. It's 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 something you benefit from when this game is part of your life over time, and these shakeups actually mean something because they have some context rather than it being like. Well, it's sort of like it feeds the same kind of like soap opera thing. Like, is an mm. is a continuing drama, mm. you know, and like, a, oh, what happens now? Yeah, right. We've been, uh, Pip and I have been playing a lot of Teamfight Tactics because Pip still plays a lot of Teamfight Tactics. And I think they have an interesting solution to this because I agree. I think, I think auto battlers have an issue with being quite substantially RNG based to, to an extent. You know, they're, they can feel a bit gambling. They're very fun, but they're sort of fun because they're not that taxing in a way. They're, they have a little bit of a roulette wheel sort of hmm. feel to them. I think, which the, makes them actually, I think like they fulfill we're talking about role like games fulfilling roles like yeah it's not the poodle game it's the relaxed game because it like part of your brain can switch off yeah you can switch just off watch, watch the stuff happening mm. it's, it's kind of interesting like because they sort of exist in a space between being able to switch off and play and and being able to win if you think extremely hard yeah, yeah, yeah. like it's it's like and you can probably like you can do a bit of stinking really hard and then you can sit back for a bit a little bit as well there's sort of yeah. waxes and wanes um, but what they are doing, I think, with teamfight tactics is doing it in these sort of seasons where at the moment, like, this entire theme is about elements and all the allegiances are about elements and all the characters are about different elements and so on. And as far as I'm aware, when that season's over, they're just going to throw that out and replace it with a completely different yeah. set, which is one way to get around the – it's clever. It, it gets around yeah. the issue a bit because – and it's also something they can do because – they just they just use different because it's the same engine as League of Legends. It's the same models as League of Legends, so they just use League of Legends skins to theme characters around whatever they need to be. Like every one of the games got an ice theme skin at this point, so if they need to make any given character ice themed, they just can. So they're not really bound to you know you know the core assets or stuff like that. It's yeah, I know that's a bit of a project management win, but you know, <laughs> good for them. Yeah. But it's like, it is one of those enabling things. I was, I was thinking about Magic the Gathering and the fact that like, you know, three times a year, or was it four, three times a year, four times a year, they released the whole new season and the new yeah. set. Like, you know, it's a whole new set, 300, I can't remember, 300 cards, 400 cards, mm. like all with new mechanics, new stuff added. All your old cards, you can still play with them, but they're not like in the meta now. Like they've been shunted aside and like, now you've got a whole new game to play. And it's kind of sitting on the outside. It's definitely, definitely feels exhausting. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and but expensive. As well. And expensive. Yeah. But it's also necessary, I think, to the health of those games. Yeah. You need, you need the constant shift. Mm. But then I was thinking about stuff like, um, Go, where <laughs> funny that nobody's come up with new content for Go for several hundred <laughs> years now. <laughs> and, um, like the famously with, um, with the, the machine learning stuff that, that, um, DeepMind has been working on. Um, uh, you know, when, you know, the, the, it was, it was supposed that Go was such a complicated game. Like it, it hasn't needed new content and characters and stuff because the, its possibility space is so. Yeah. Uncut in, you know, uncomprehend, incomprehensibly now, big. Yes, Apparently. and it has, but like, Do you see but the, there was world, a sweet world... spot in the middle. Yeah, so the, yeah, I was, yeah I was, there's a sweet spot just as it, just as uh, DeepMind's AI uh, was in the first ma- few matches with with professional players, where the things it did reinvigorated the, the human scene because it was do, using strategies that no human player was doing. Like, obviously, there isn't there is a meta in in the game in the human game, but like the computer was doing the things that everybody thought was shit play. And then it ended up like directly being really fucking good play. And apparently like rather than getting a bit depressed about the fact they were bitten by a robot, um, the, the professional players were found the game suddenly enlivened. The meta mm. had been shaken up in that way that kind of content was required in a lot of games, like in video games. Um, uh, but yeah, now, like, as you said, is. It, it beats all human players and there's no way back from it now to the extent that one, uh, like one of the leading players who was beaten, uh, has retired saying, I just can't do it anymore because, you know, hats off to them, but I, there's no, nothing for me to do here anymore because I can't be the best because 
a fucking robot done it. Mm. It's kind of sad. Yeah. But it's so, yeah. Like in, in a game, and like I suppose that proves the point that you need to shake up the rules mm. if you don't want that kind of end point. Well, it's like the, the drama of these games at the end of the day, whether it's magic or Dota or anything, is people versus understanding of mechanics. And there is something people find very compelling about having mechanics that are deep enough that it's hard to ever master them. Like the unsolvableness is, is, is the point to return yeah. to that. Yeah. It's the same with chess, right? Like it's sort of, you know, there's, that there is, you know, I think we have a, as animals, like an interesting relationship with, there is no correct decision here. There is just probability and judgment and it exists in that kind of fuzzy, you know, state in the middle where you can only make the best judgment you can make right now. And that has loads of drama and you have to be the angler fish. You do. Who has to eat the male during the mating process and grow gonads on the side of your head or whatever they do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a weird patch. Like I said, this, this, <laughs> this new dope mat is real weird. Um, <laughs> uh, Shall we do some questions from questions? Sure. It's time for that. Mm-hmm. Daniel writes, Hi, folks. In anticipation of some kind of seasonal year in review episode, do any of you have a best games writing this year that you would like to highlight? I would go with Sin Vega's review of Eliza on RPS, a perfect example of why subjectivity in game reviews is so important. Cheers, Daniel. Hmm. That is a very, very good review. I haven't read it. I will read it. There you Not go. Now, though. Yeah. I have not read it either, but I will. Okay. This I'm interested. Should... I'm really, like, I should have done because I'm interested in that game as well. I was just going to say this would be the time to confess that I've read barely any games writing this year that wasn't for work. Yeah. Yeah. I've enjoyed, <laughs> I've in, I enjoyed, uh, Nate Crowley's, uh, Chimpanzee Museum, uh, done, uh, d- uh Dwarf Fortress hmm. series, but, yeah, that's good. I like uh some of Nick Rubin's writing as well. Mm, yeah, he's, he's good. not that he's written like big profound think piece that one would find in an awards category, but he's done a lot of, you know, really kind of nicely written reviews and news stories and things and, you know, sell it. Well, I don't know, but to me as as a <laughs> yeah, no. like, who's been a jobbing writer doing those things, yeah, yeah. there is a real art to making those things exciting and interesting and he does it. Yeah, you know? that's absolutely true. It's like it's like, a bit like, like Alice O'Connor, yeah, yeah, who's yeah, an yeah. amazing news writer. Yeah. I appreciate uh uh Cass Marshall in Polygon. She writes reliably funny sort of one-off stories about times in games including uh Sea of Thieves, the kind of light and fun Hmm. And she's very, very, very capable of writing more serious stuff as well. But enjoy a fun story about video game. Hmm. Don't tend to read other forms of game criticism or think pieces much anymore, really, no. at all. Apart from, like, the really good investigative stuff that gets done. Yeah. yeah. Um, What's but, the informational? Uh, Shreya. Mr. Yeah, Shreya's Mr. stuff. Mr. Shreya's. Um, it's always yeah. entertaining. I think uh, 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 <laughs> Sean Freud. A little bit. A little bit. But though, as someone, you know, working in games... On the other side of the fence, uh, it's actually kind of a useful touchstone to be like, if we were, if, if there was a problem with our project or if there's a problem with how we were handling things, what would, is it Shreer or Shreya? Shreya. Uh, Shreya. What would Jason Shreya write about us now? <laughs> well, <laughs> like, oh, incidentally, it's not Schadenfreude at the suffering of the people. It's Schadenfreude at the companies being exposed. Yeah, right. Yeah. For their terrible practices. The, the punch upitude. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, and, and obviously a lot of, uh, Cecilia Denistasio's work yes. over the last mm. year has been, has been great as well. Um, but yeah, beyond that sort of broader industry stuff, I tend, I, this is a bit of a confession, just genuinely don't read a lot of games journalism anymore. Yeah. Oh, oops. <laughs> Steve writes, Dear Crow and Jay Bird, please never apologize for extended discussions about birds. If you created a bird game, what would it be? Birds are good. Core, core, steak. <laughs> nice. Hmm. A bird game. I think there's probably um like a, a pretty uh, good dance, dance revolution thing you could do with the birds of paradise. You see a bird, it does a little dance. You have to mimic it using your mm. ungainly human body, and then you fuck. <laughs> um. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um. <laughs> I would. I would like. Uh. 
to do a uh, a crow detective game, uh, hmm. a murder game, if you will, <laughs> a murder uh, of crows. Yeah, that that was the. <laughs> Oh, was, that was, the, that, that was the joke there. Was Alex. that yeah, the joke? That was the, yeah, that was, was it. Was that the joke? That was it, yeah. yeah. That was it, yeah. But the reason for this is a different interesting pro fact that I knew, I know, uh, I found out, which is apparently, this could be complete bollocks, but I googled it while in bed once, so it's gotta be true. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is that, um, because, uh, crows are often thought to hold funerals because they will gather around a dead crow. Mm-hmm. And they're dressed all in black and, and so on. Um, but apparently this is not it. Apparently, uh, according to, uh, someone uh, on the internet who presumably knows what they're talking about. Uh, crows gather around to kind of determine what killed the crow and kind of give it a name and warn each other about it. So uh, the game would be about naming things that have killed other crows and trying to develop a taxonomy of local huh. threats. Vos- Voxel yeah. Astra. <laughs> 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 Loud child. <laughs> Did many children kill crows by being yeah. loud? Oh. Especially uh, around here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, maybe some sort of like co-op thing where you have to kind of agree on the name of what's mm. going to kill a crow so you can warn each other about it by honking. That's That would be my bird game. Hmm. Alex? Alex, you got a bird game? Just flying about. That's what I like to do. There are flying lot, about. There are quite a lot. There of are a few kind of bird flying about because yeah. I wasn't going to say it because like there's flugel, 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 f u g l. Okay. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> and some other games where you are bird and f u direct and you x do fly. Yeah. Rendering joke then. But they are. I do like the bird feel because a good bird feel <laughs> is hard to find. Yeah. Please be this gentle. Please don't bird bird <laughs> the, the, the phrase bird paradise. feel can't be a thing. <laughs> yeah. If we can elevate this genre, the bird genre, <laughs> hmm. probably I think bird field would become a thing. Yeah, VR games come with a roast chicken. <laughs> you can fondle as you play it. <laughs> Perfect. Very bony birds. Mm. We, had par- we had a parrot. When I grown up, did you? Parrot. I love parrots. Parrots are really nice. He was a little fucker, but oh. <laughs> and he he was <sighs> touching him wasn't ever as good as you'd think because they looked fluffy, but they were fucking bony underneath. Yeah. They're kind of how hard were you squeezing the parrot, Alex? <laughs> he liked a good squeeze. No, they, they he liked he he wanted his his neck and his head um, caressed with the finger, hmm. and um, but of course, like the. The, the feathers are kind of pointy and kind of hard quilled. Mm. And then underneath, it's this sort of scrawny little body. I feel like... Refuted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so my it's review of birds... Six, six, six out of ten review of parrots. <laughs> <laughs> it's not everything. They're not everything you think, you know. They're not all you know, that. Yeah, not no, this that. is not the review. This is the discourse the week after the reviews come out. <laughs> Parrots come out. Everyone's like, fuck, it's like Bioshock. 10 out of 10. What it's a It's like Joker. Yeah. Everyone thinks, oh, Joker looks Fucking brilliant. Fucking incredible. No, actually, hang on. <laughs> Todd <laughs> That's parrot. Actually, it's rather thin. And if this same film wasn't attached to a comic book, if this parrot wasn't about Batman, no one would give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't funny and loud. Uh, I, there's a, there's a really old, there's the, the thing I, that has caused me an enduring love of parrots, regardless of your denigration of them. We haven't been close to one, let's face it. Is, <laughs> is this this really old piece of BPC archival footage of some kind of experiment? I don't know how valid the experiment was, but there was a parrot involved and it was meant to be getting like a nut at the end of doing this thing. It refused to do the thing, but it wanted the nut and it was saying, want nut, want nut. Well, nuts. And it was not giving the given nut. It was trying, you know, scientists was like, you know, you've got to, got to do this. And it was like, what nut? What nut? And it was like, walk away. And it just shuffles down the, down the perch at the end. And that's it's the most heartbreaking thing <laughs> yeah. I think I've ever seen. And, you know, so anything you say about parents, I'm just going to. Uh, I grew up with uh, two budgies that fucking loved Willie Nelson. <laughs> 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 How do they express this love? Just sort of swaying and bopping. Huh. Just having a good time. Yeah. It was good. Loved them. There must be some kind of game about the, uh, about the, the sonic accoutrements of birds. Making, being able to make really good peeps. Mm. Maybe you have some kind of little synthesizer thing that you can do to, mm. to make really good peeps. And then you fuck. <laughs> <laughs> then you fuck. 
<laughs> using the roast chicken <laughs> peripheral oh, for supplies. Oh no! <laughs> oh fuck! Good bird feel. <laughs> Perfect tea time. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> God. This is... This, oh, wow, this that is, oh, I wasn't ready perfectly. for that. I wasn't ready for that, and I'm sorry to everyone else who wasn't ready for that. <sighs> um, I think we've answered Stig's nice, innocent <laughs> question. <laughs> core, core, Stig. Core, core. <laughs> Tom Lander writes, Greetings, Super Crow Box. This is going to be a theme. Uh, towards the end of Shenmue 2... After the final climactic battle, the player must traverse rural China with a new acquaintance. During this final section of the game, the previously urgent and blaring quick time events, the preceding dozens of hours of gameplay, are replaced with a gentle and relatively unintrusive prompt that uses much softer tones. Further, the obstacles represented by these prompts are minor with little consequence of failure. For example, a log blocks your path, whether you hop over it or trip is inconsequential to the resolution of the game. It's like burping just there. <laughs> this, see, this is the hazard of the beer podcast. Yeah, you get, Mark, Mark gets weirdly explicit about parrots <laughs> and then burps all the way through a gentle question about quick time events. <laughs> Further, the obstacles represented by, oh, I've read that part, sorry. I can't think of many examples of games that wind down challenge wise in this way. <laughs> Are there any other games you can think of that take the primary challenge and soften it into something more sublime towards the ending? Let's all go back to the first. <laughs> Cheers. Tom Lando. It's a good name, isn't it? It is a good name. Hmm. It's not really softening, but obviously Half-Life's gravity gun is a, is a switcheroo on the... I think it's a rapid hardening. That's the power, yeah, the power yeah, but hardening. It's, but it's also kind of therapeutic. Yeah, right? I think, yeah, I guess what we're going for is coders. Mm. Basically, like, you know... Uh, Moments of Ooh, catharsis. Mm. Witcher 3. Do you remember the bit towards the end? I haven't played spoiler it Spoiler time. Oh, still okay. Played it. Oh, okay. We, this isn't really a spoiler because... <laughs> you just went spoiler time. <laughs> well, is it, it's talking it? about... It is explicitly talking about the end of the game, but you know what... The, <laughs> so it is a spoiler. But at the same time, you know it's going to happen. Like, you're, you're looking for Siri, right? And the spoiler, my spoiler is merely this. Mute... Mute now, if you wish to. Uh, <laughs> you find Siri, right? Oh, right. Okay. right? Uh, yeah. Cool. And she's be- being your daughter. You get this right at the end of the game. You get this long, actually really be- nicely drawn out, quiet period where you get to spend time with her. And it's right before the big denouement, mm. but it's actually this really nice moment. Really mm. beautifully done, I thought, actually. Mm. There are definitely like nice pauses in games. I wonder if his this guy's yeah, this guy's question is more about specifically mechanics being kind of wound down, wound down in a way, or flipped in a way, which produces. Uh, it's like there isn't there isn't soft. a Call of Duty game where you just go about tasing people. At the yeah, end. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cuddling people. <laughs> it's painful. Hmm. That'd be great, the Call of Duty ending where everyone goes to like laser tag or something. <laughs> That's a lovely time, and, and like. You know, Captain Price or whatever is yeah. like, oh, you got me. <laughs> and Captain Price everyone gets kisses, overexcited and, and runs. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd play that. It would be good. Right so, it hands. would be so good. I mean, that, yeah, that would, that would be. Because effectively, I mean, that's oh, what yeah. it, it, it's all, it all is just a preamble to it, isn't it? Really? <laughs> like, you may war? never get there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> when you boil it down. Yeah. Zero dark flirty. I mean, if you crouch... <laughs> you're yeah. crouching through a bean field with price in front of you. Yeah. Crouching. <laughs> oh, the danger. His pert latex the buttocks. The danger. Like your life is in his hands. Mm. Mm. It's really quite a sexy game. Yeah. I feel like this might be the worst question section we've ever done. <laughs> it could be. It could be. Let's see how we can debauch so we fuck Travis's the birds, question. We fuck the fighting men. Um, oh, God. This <laughs> Travis writes, Hello. On the last pod, you spoke about games' power to evoke a feeling or mood or how sometimes the mechanics can interfere with that. This reminded me of Air Car. 
a free VR game on Steam. It's just instrumental Vangelis-like music, pattering rain running off your canopy in a sodden neon city with holograms revolving on the tops of buildings. Try to fuck that, guys. Um, the only problem, it's impossible to have sex with Vangelis. <laughs> <laughs> the only objective is to fly around until you've found all the landing pads with gentle, indistinct radio chatter to keep you company. Barely an actual game, really. Just a place to be and feel, and a thing to feel. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> Shit, I've got to put a question here. Um, what's your favourite type of insect in a game? Cheers, Travis, aka TJ Howes on Discord. A very practical man who does a lot of DIY. Makes me feel like less of a man <laughs> as a consequence. <laughs> he knows how to handle a drill. <laughs> so, uh, insects. Oh dear, podcast going real weird. <laughs> insects in games. New Minecraft bees, pretty good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Does yeah. pollination, does all the kinds of things you could put it to sleep with smoke. Honey. Honey, <laughs> yeah. Um, mm. Ant lions are pretty good. I knew ant lions, yeah. yeah. Zerg. Are they insects? I mean, they're. Yeah. I suppose they're. They're yeah, tyranids, yeah. is what they are. Yeah. What was the RTS about insti- insects? There was, I mean, there was Sim Ant. Sim Ant. Mm. I'm, I'm sure there was an actual, like, Total Annihilation style. I think you're right. RTS game about bugs. And I cannot remember what it was called. If you know, let us know. I found that very dramatic, but I also might be making it up. There could be more games about ants, I would say. Yeah, it's really crying out for a good ant simulator. I find a lot of the... Uh, so there's um a bee game coming out mm. next year. I think I've seen it in in Steam uh, as a wish list item. Uh, and you play bees in a hive and you go around flying around at the, that kind of tiny little level. But... um. There's some really interesting things to, to simulate about hive-based organisms and how they learn about the world and the kinds of choices that they can make to mm. affect their drones. There's Did a really know? good Roblox game about um, bees. Oh, there's a what? Sim? A really good Roblox game about bees. Oh, like a mini game. Uh, Within Roblox, you mean? Yeah, like it's one of the Roblox games. Game, a Roblox game. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And um, you... Getting into the sim antics there. <laughs> Good. Uh, in this game, you collect a collection of bees and you level them up over time. You then go to flower fields and you click a button and your bees kind of do stuff and collect like pollen for you on like depending on like how leveled up and what type they are. You maybe get attacked by giant uh, bugs and your bees will fight them for you. And you go back and you make honey and then you invest the honey in better stuff. Nice. To make you collect more pollen, mm. more. Thanks, and, Black Friday. And then you get to, <laughs> and then you get to explore more of that. And it's really colourful, and it's very Robloxy. But there's something just really nice about it. Very mm. breezy, lovely, and there's lots of mm. stuff going on. It's good. What I what I fundamentally want from the hive simulator is a sort of fog of war, which respects the knowledge that you have from sending out drones, oh, and right. you don't get sight to anywhere until something comes back to Pheromones. you. So I've got an interesting... So I don't know if I've told this story on the pod before, because I think I have, but it may also be bollocks, but we'll find out. Mm. So the same... Uh, I have a friend who has a PhD in uh, both um, bird facts and bee facts, mm. which is a joke she's heard a lot. Mm. Um, but apparently, bees explain how far away things are to each other uh, by counting the number of objects between them and the thing. Is that what the waggle dance is all about? Well, it's like, it's, you know, this is a theory about some of the information contained in, in the waggle dance, because how do they measure distance, right? They don't have meters or kilometers, or whatever. Mm. Apparently a bee's measure of distance is number of objects or like informational density of the space, basically, huh. which means that lakes confuse bees because they are one thing, but they are massive. Huh. Um, you know, they want undifferentiated thing with no informational kind of content. So it's like the, the difference between it's four things that way can be massively different depending on the type of thing. That would be a really interesting way to do fog of war where it would be like right. a really interesting thing. And it's 60, 60 objects that way, but you don't know what that means until you've sort of sounded out from a few different angles and you realize that you've sort of described a picture of an environment through quantity. Right. Yeah, it's, it's like one of those, uh, you know, those, those voting maps of Britain, which tell you the size of the population, but distort the actual geography, mm. if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. You I don't know if that's true or not, but you could build a game around this wild falsehood. <laughs> if you're <laughs> a bee, let us know. If you're a bee. What do you? 
map your environment with. <laughs> Zoe writes, Greetings, pod friends. I'm re-listening to several of my favourite episodes right now, and in episode 180, Captain Buffalo, which still makes me chortle, you mentioned playing FTL by committee. I remember doing that. Mm. I too have done this with some friends at work in lunch hour. We were nearly at the end, having made an incredible series of choices, and had maybe one or two more choices to make. I wanted to go one way, my friend another. He won the co-captain argument. He was wrong, and we died. I will never let him forget this. <laughs> and it has been actual years since it happened. <laughs> what is your longest held gaming grudge with another person, particularly a dear friend? So hmm. I don't think I have grudges, really. A Dota player without grudges? I'm nice. I mean, I have long-standing jokes that will never go away. Mm. While we're while we're getting spicy on the podcast, I can tell the story of uh, my good friend Dan, a uh, reliable Dota 2 support, very reactive, always ready with a teleport scroll to zip to your location should you get in trouble. He once expressed this by saying the phrase, very deadpan, let me know if it gets hairy and I'll come immediately. <laughs> and... <laughs> That has become a phrase that we just use in a lot of, a lot of contexts. Um, <laughs> Poor Dan. No, good for Dan. Thanks, thanks Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Fan. Um, trying to think grudges though. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't play, I, I think, don't play like that. Like, I think hmm. I, I would like to, but I don't really get the opportunities. I'm not. I hate. I hate the feeling competition. So anybody who makes me feel competitive in a negative way, I stop playing with them. Generally, is that why? Well, no. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why I don't play competitive games with anybody I know. <laughs> uh, but I, I like playing cooperatively with people I know. But yeah. I just don't um, don't play competitively for that reason. So I've sort of excised any chance of me being able to answer this question basically from my life. I think. I think I have a. I don't know if it's a form of grudge when it comes to games with the pip. But I know, I know in my heart that Pip will subvert any plan I have. So it's not really a grudge based on a specific moment. It's more that I can rely on her that like, I knew this playing Sea of Thieves yesterday, mm. that the moment I slip into sort of accidental captaincy, <laughs> which is a trait, you know, <laughs> like I did drift towards the end to be like, I'm just having a nice time with my friends, not taking it too seriously. I'll be the navigator to like drop anchor hall sails, <laughs> port side. Ah! <laughs> and, and that I know at this point, the pip will be ready to like dive into the sea. Cause she's seen a, a cool <laughs> shark <laughs> or something. Um, you know, to, to ensure that my, my plans, Ganaglay in a kind of like you know teaching way. <laughs> Always there with a lesson, you know. I like, don't try and control things. That does remind me that playing. Oh god, I've completely forgotten the name of it. The cooking, like collaborative cooking game, overcooked, overcooked mm. uh, with my family. That was pretty rift making. I mean, that's a really stressful game. I mean, that, so that's stressful. up there with Neptune's Pride. Yeah. Is there? <laughs> yeah. Oh, grudges. Jesus Christ. Yes. Yeah, I mean, Tim Edwards, Tim Edwards, let's name names. <laughs> he launched an attack on my empire when he knew I was getting onto a fucking plane and would be unavailable for eight hours. Classic I, Edwards. I logged in when I got to the hotel and saw my empire ground to dust hmm. by Tim, Tim Edwards, Tim Edwards. Tim Edwards. There was some dirty shit that happened in Natural's Pride <laughs> That's which, which is why I never got into it but uh, yeah there were definitely grudges I do have one grudge I can talk about so years ago we did a PC game versus RPS Dota match mm. and I took this really fucking seriously because of course I did so <laughs> I made a PowerPoint presentation for the other four members of the PC gamer team and the point was other people on the PC gamer team have never played Dota or never played more than like 10 minutes so I teach them all from scratch, made a PowerPoint presentation. I made a GIF where I overlaid their heads on different Tracy brothers from <laughs> Thunderbirds to illustrate what positions one to five meant. <laughs> from space station to rocket, you know, the full gamut of mm. types of man um, <laughs> that one can be. I took it very seriously, but also took the, the spirit of the thing very seriously. They were complete newbies, you know, came up with characters they could have, may, not, may or may not play, so on. Meanwhile, captain of the RPS team, who else but Pip, 
<laughs> get a team. Were that, you going, were you uh, romantically involved at this point? Yes, we were we were living together. Okay. Um uh you know, she she assembles a team that consists of her and Alice O'Connor who'd been playing Dota at this point for like 15 years or something. <laughs> which is fine. We kind of accepted that, but the other people on the team were I think I think it was Brendy and Alec or it was supposed to be maybe not Brendy. It was supposed to be no, Adam. I think it was supposed to be Adam, Alec and Rich Stanton on the RPS team, filling out three newbies, right? And they were obviously being very RPS about it, very laissez-faire, not pretending not to care, obviously. Like, you know, whatever. But then Rich Stanton fell asleep for, like, all day. <laughs> <laughs> he fell asleep all day. Oh, yeah, and, so, and so he couldn't play. He missed the game. And so Pip roped in uh, Quinn's. Quentin Smith, um, who I started playing Dota with. And yes, Quinn stopped playing, but he still definitely had played like 200 hours of that game. And like, oh, I'm new. I can't remember anything. Bollocks, Quinns. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we lost because I tried too hard. <laughs> yeah, t- tell me about the, the dynamics on your team after they had absorbed your PowerPoint presentation. Did you fire them up? I feel like or I don't like to get people. I, like, I mean, I think what I learned is I don't like to get people too fired up. I like to make people feel ready. But what that meant was that people felt confused and tired before <laughs> before anything had happened. Which Tracy brother Whereas am I? Whereas Pips, no one gives a fuck about this approach, turned out to get better morale out of her people. <laughs> well, um, out of the three players who are very very experienced as well. Yeah, let's not forget. Yeah, like, three, as opposed to one on your team. Yes, ex- thank you, Alex. <laughs> I, I thought I didn't have grudges. It turns out. A do um i'm still angry about that it turns out all these years later hmm i just feel like i just feel like we were robbed and also I fucked like it. a sore loser <laughs> Sorry, no. no no you're absolutely right true. you're absolutely right um. <sighs> well i left that job Bye. as a result graham writes hi trucks and tow bars if an NPC barks in the forest and you don't hear it, did they really bark? Probably not. Probably that if, if sound they, was not loaded into the game as a result say, of proximity. Yeah. Yeah. It's just bad use of memory. Yeah. yeah, it's ridiculous. Bad programming. For a real question, what is now the best gaming web store? Graham, do you have strong feelings about this? Gaming web store? I mean, do you mean like... the uh, Steam versus Epic, I guess. Mm. Versus Itch.io. Oh, the one that has the game you want on it at the price you want. I do like Itch.io. I quite I like Humble. Well. Although Humble's really a vehicle for getting Steam keys, I guess. Hmm. I don't have strong feelings. I quite like the, the Steam redesign. I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I whined about it when it first came up, but actually... That was because it was new and scary. It was new and scary, and also it didn't do the things that uh, specifically I wanted it to do from a list of games but at the same time it has done things I didn't know that I wanted to do that it does do that uh, <laughs> they do that don't they so shortly after it launched it did it, it provided me with some developer written posts about games that I previously played which were just really interesting uh, there's a piece on Disco Elysium about how one of its systems works how its political system works yeah. and I wouldn't have read that or even known that it existed had it not been for this new Steam store so that is the best thing visually though I do not like their fussy looks and I find there's it a lot more stuff hard on it. to read and it's messy and all over the fucking place I find it harder to parse a list of words when they have icons next to them weirdly I would have thought it was the other way around I might have mm. already said this on the podcast with John Roberts but I can't remember but, I've um, heard you say it yeah. But that's 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 how I feel about it. Um, out of interest, can I ask you a really boring question? Absolutely. Can you still oh, yeah. sort by install size? Because I size use, you can, size. but not by disc. You can't tell what disc things are on anymore. Oh, that's okay. I don't care that because, like, yeah, I can't find the option that shows the you know a view with like stats on it, and because I am running out of space, and I want to know what's taking up space, so I know what to decide to get rid of quite important for me can i can i say having dipped into the xbox app waters with this microsoft game pass stuff over the last 48 hours that thing is a fucking <laughs> howling <laughs> shit show oh man yeah. I mean, so Mike, like one Castle night- is a big advocate for it he's like everybody's complaining about this it's been no problem for me it's just people hate microsoft i'm like 
I used to work for Microsoft and I couldn't play Minecraft on my own PC because there was some fucking conflict between user and my login or something. I, I didn't have the, Pip had the real username, um, you know, fuckery experience, but like I, I had, well, it's like you don't really have a game library. It just shows you the shop. And if you have to own the game, that's yeah. great. But otherwise it's just going to show you the shop. That's bad. But the other thing is, um, because Windows 10's indexing is all over the fucking place, like it just forgot it had the app. I just didn't know where yeah. it was anymore, even though it's Windows 10's own game store. Mm. So if I searched for games or Xbox, it would find other things rather than yeah. itself. Incredible. Yeah. yeah, the one time I was going to actually play uh, uh, Sea of Thieves with friends, with Owen, in fact, uh, I, it decided that it wasn't installed, and it was, and it meant that I had to delete it. Well, no, I couldn't delete it because it's in it a wasn't installed, protected yeah. place. And, um, and I had to reinstall it and there was problems and I didn't get to play. Yeah. Spent all evening not downloading. If you want to change, if you want to get it to install games to, let's say, a secondary hard drive rather than a Windows install SSD, you have to make, tell Windows to install all future apps to that drive. Yeah, that's cool. So that's definitely not the, your favorite. I mean, Windows is a fairly new thing. Yeah. Right? I mean, so, I mean, Realistically, they haven't. Had, yeah, yeah, they just haven't uh, had time to adapt. Person who didn't sign the email, so I don't know how to address them, says, uh, "I used to feel giddy and excited for a new Dota patch. Now I feel tired and weary. Have the Dota patches changed, or have I? You have." Wham Badger writes, <laughs> <laughs> "Sorry, dear, dear Chickadee and Cockatoo." Uh, what Warhammer slash Warhammer 40k with a reskin would be best for a Bird Wars game? What are the bird themed questions this week? Obviously, this has excited the imaginations of our Oh, this is the Bird Wars we of, need of more... this region, right? Mm-hmm. Is it? Bear Ball Bird Wars. <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't know, sorry. <laughs> Options include Seven Animation <laughs> Space Marine. <clears throat> what? <laughs> <laughs> Options. Beer in- pods, man. <laughs> <laughs> Options include 7 out of 10 Space Marine, where <laughs> Mark Strong voiced Jay smashes his way through a horde of crows, and Total Warhammer with Marsh's house replacing the vortex of power. Discuss slash argue. Keep up the good podding. Wham Badger. P.S. Miniatures monthly. Coming before Christmas. Uh, we have to think about renaming it. Um, <laughs> yeah. here's my tip. Never name a, if you're never aiming, find yourself naming a podcast, and I know a lot of you out there are men over 30, so you will. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, just don't put a frequency or in the title of your, of your thing. It's just, it's just not worth it. Mm. Um, but, uh, Hmm. hmm. I defer to you, men, with your greater Warhammer knowledge about which games so, could be reskinned to imbue. Uh, so this is an the bird, avian Just to angle. be clear, this is the bird war. What Chris noticed outside? What happens? This yeah, year, the incredible house. Sonic yeah. bird war. Sonic bird war. Um, well, I, noise I, marines. Then yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. There you go. It's, um, what's that? So hang on. I don't. That? I don't think I understand the scope Sonic? of the question. Slanash. Yeah, the Emperor's children. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, specifically asking which I think. Uh, video game adaptation of Warhammer would be mm. the best fit for a bird-based war so game. So the, um, I have said it before, but Mechanicus, which is a great game, mm-hmm. um, has a really strong line in, uh, Animal Crossing speak. It's the best application of Animal <laughs> Crossing speak in a grimdark setting. Yes. <laughs> it's a lot of rubber man going like, <laughs> but and with more then- modem noises. Beep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, like a, um, and that's a Mechanicus man where like, whereas like a, uh, I don't know, like a, a Necron will just go like, <laughs> and background. it's good. And um, that could easily be applied to bird, bird song. Hmm. Um, I would enjoy that. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I kind of want that particular thing applied to all Warhammer 40,000 aspects. So like you got the mm-hmm. Imperial Guard commissar or something who's like, <laughs> <laughs> and like a space marine. <laughs> what will Mark, Mark Strong? What will he do? Well, he'll make he... a wibbly noise. Oh, 
Yeah, but once he provided the one wibbly noise, like he's mm. out of a joke. I've been listening to mm. um, Horus Heresy uh, audiobooks recently. <laughs> I have, yeah. And hey, there's been a very good um, Humble, Humble Bundle. There was a good Humble that, Bundle. That it was a great, it was fantastic value. Amazing, yeah. And um, yeah, it's, there's a... Does he voice those? No, but there's, um, if you didn't realize that you wanted to tread the weird middle ground of a Venn diagram that has Radio 4 on one end and like Grimdark Ultraviolence <laughs> on the other <laughs> then you really need to go there it's like oh. yeah, like the bolt round took the alien's torso all the way off its giblets <laughs> splashed upon his faceplate and he thought glory to the emperor <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's great read by Sandy Toxvick <laughs> 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 um, I'm trying to think what other Warhammer games would make good uh, Battlefleet Gothic Battleflock Gothic oh my <laughs> god that's the name that's it that's the one yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> my carrier pigeon is under attack Battleflock Corvid maybe that's what it is yeah Sorry, that was really diaphragmal <laughs> kind of you've gone gone in. full Mark Strong yeah this is what happens. This is what happens when we talk about birds and drink beer. <laughs> Stuart writes, Liebe Kister und Brechstanger. I have no idea if that's the correct pronunciation. Apologies Any of to the people words. of Germany. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw a short documentary about elderly people playing video games. Alex? <laughs> Anitas. Look, he's a mad keen gamer, <laughs> particularly for his age. <laughs> One of the stories followed a team of retirees competing in a Counter-Strike tournament. Apparently, a marketing firm in Sweden wanted to organize an esports event for the elderly. When they couldn't find an existing team, they decided to make their own. Have you heard of similar stories of game slash tech companies actively trying to court silver gamers? Furthermore... If you were a massive media conglomerate trying to advertise existing game franchises to the elderly, what marketing strategies do you think would be effective? Cheers, Stuart. And there will be links to this documentary in the show notes. No. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen this. But you know when you play in Fortnite, mm. I like them silver gamers come on. And I like, fucking hell. You know, you hear them... See them moving yeah, around. Yeah, just, well, I don't know, just yeah. you, on the open mic, yeah. chat and shit, openly owning property. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talking about what's on at the Donmar warehouse this week, that kind of thing. It's the Awful. worst. Yeah. It's bringing down that game. Attending regional adaptations of Noel Coward plays. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and you know, because they're always on cruises. Yeah. Mm. Fucking ping is terrible. Fucks everything up. Yeah. Uh, do we have a sensible answer to this question? I'm trying to think of one, but I really don't know. (laughs) Alex, you're old. How can someone advertise to you? What, what, what would you respond to? Pleading. 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 Please. (laughs) Please play my game. I think the only outreach to the elderly that I can think of are games as some form of therapy for their oldness. Yeah. Like, like and, and I find it brain I'm, training. Yeah, in some ways it's had inevitable. A silver haired person in the television adverts. Brain yeah. training is a good example, actually. Yes. Mm. Yep. Uh, I'm but then it's, I'm, the thing is, you know, as, as I'm getting older, I find it much You have harder. no idea. You have no idea. <laughs> I've got grey hair in my beard now, Alex. I'm basically dead. I'm, I had a haircut yesterday and I, all I could see was grey hair, like being mm. snipped from my scalp. There are my dead cells, you say, as they fall to the floor. What's the point in growing more? <laughs> <laughs> Soon this is all I will be swept up by a barber into a box. <laughs> Take the rest of it. <laughs> Take my Sweep fingers me. and my arms. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, the games. I think, but, yeah. I think being old is going to be fucking rad if we live that long. Uh, it's going to be great as long as the systems that are presented to us are ones that we understand. already have existing learning for. I think the, the reason that games aren't marketed to elderly people now is because frankly, I already find it far too hard to learn new things. And mm. for, for older people whose brains have lost all plasticity, um, <laughs> well, such as yourself, Alex. It must be. It must be just incredibly difficult. Mm. How do you imbibe any information at your greatly advanced age? I don't. 
<laughs> See, I reckon that um, we're going to remain plastic for longer. Really? And therefore be able to uh, learn new things deeper into life because... Because you'll have brain, brain training. implants? No, because, um, because I think while I will probably not... I'm probably not going to own property, let's say, but I can own video games going forward and get my sense of, you know, progress. I'm going to get my sense of progress through leveling up or ranking up in the latest hit video game, Mm -hmm. placing myself on a series of moving ladders that are shuffled out from underneath me constantly (laughs) by a rotating series of video game publishers. What a fulfilling life. This will keep me spry and distracted (laughs) until my death. Um, whereas, uh, the, the sort of meaningful ownership of, 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 uh, of let's say property or even just the achievement of any kind of, of, of station. Mm. Um, we'll, it's paralysis, basically. It's paralysis, yeah. yeah. It's, it's the, it's, it's life. Might own... as well already be dead. Right, yeah, dad. And, um, yeah, it's the concrete shoes of, um, a meaningful series of decisions versus the giddy ephemera of my uh weightless uh <laughs> existence <laughs> i'd like to think old people some in the future are just you know rooms and rooms are full of octogenarians <laughs> pretend fucking birds of paradise <laughs> <laughs> making squawking noises that's what i'll be doing <laughs> when i retire <laughs> if it's not illegal it might be illegal i don't really know <laughs> Is it? Looking it up. Is it? <laughs> the illegal? sea will destroy all of this. <laughs> yes, thankfully. <laughs> oh boy, wow. Do we have any more questions or are we really going out on that down there? <laughs> we are, yeah, that's the end. Oh my that's god, you and your podcast. pacing. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I, I, <laughs> well, I didn't realise quite how bleak that was going to get. Come on, who's with you? <laughs> yeah. uh, if you have any more bleak or bird-based questions, you can send them to the bleak and bird, <laughs> the bleak and bird bar <laughs> at questions at crane and crowbar. Uh, <laughs> keep going. Dot com. Dot com. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, or classic. you can tweet at us. Ooh. Ooh. Sorry, that was a real fucking noise I just made. <laughs> at crane and crowbar. In fact, Twitter would be much better if it was all produced by the kind of animal crossing style. <laughs> 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 Like 90% of replies are just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mark Strong, but via a modem. <laughs> 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 oh, wow. That was good. Thanks. Um, you can, uh, watch these videos on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash Craig Crowbar. You get to look at a picture. You get to look at that a picture. Way. Sometimes it's badly compressed because I did it. There's uh, a Patreon. Patreon. There's a Patreon. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Craig and Crowbar. That's good. Everybody loves it. Join our Discord community. <laughs> yeah, Alex. Okay, I am. Uh, yeah, the, the link to that is on our website, creatingcrowbar.com. I'm giving you an encouraging what about, <laughs> how do we? How does anyone get more content from you, uh, Marsh? You can reach me at Marsh Davis on the Twitters. Hmm. What are you, Alex? I'm on at the- Rotational. That's excellent. Oh, on the Twitter. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Chris. Sorry. Uh, that's C Thurston. C T H U R S T E N. Thanks, Thanks for listening, listening everybody. everybody. Thanks for li- <laughs> <laughs> Thanks <laughs> for <laughs> eh? Ne- <Burr. laughs> what is happening? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>